Welcome to Celluloid Mirror. I'm your hostess, Betty St. Laveau. On this show, we discuss film definitions, do a little bit of film history and theory, and then we go straight into the movies. Today is our first episode of um, uh, City of Angels. We're doing movies made in Hollywood or made in Hollywood about Hollywood. So I'd like to just start off with uh, talking about the movies today. So this first movie is a personal favorite of mine. It's called A Star is Born. It's one of those movies that get remade frequently, just like The Three Musketeers and um, what's that other one? There's a couple of them that get remade constantly, but A Star is Born is one of them. As a matter of fact, a new version is about to come out, and I probably won't go to see it. But this version that I love stars Janet Gaynor, Frederick Mosh, uh, Lionel Standish, uh, Annie Devine, May Robson and Adolf Menu, who um, Menju, who uh, during the Red Scare in Hollywood, um, he turned actors in. So he's sort of not really one of my favorite actors. Um, he plays the studio head, and Lionel Stander, who plays Liv Liddy, the publicity guy, was married five or six or seven times. And when you look at look this guy, he. Um, He's handsome in his own way, but he had this really gravelly voice, so I think he must have been quite a ladies' man um, back in the day. So, Janet Gaynor stars as Esther Victoria Blodgett, and on her rise through the Hollywood ranks, uh, they change her name to Vicki Lester. She meets Frederick March, Norman Maine, who is a down-and-out uh, actor who actually is when she meets him, he's on his on the way to his slippery slope, his downward spiral. So this is a beautiful, dreamy, tragic story all about Hollywood and the snake pit that it is. So whenever I used to say to my mom, I'm going to LA, she'd be like, oh, I don't know. Our plan is to make movies here. So then I would say to her, what about Star is Born? And she told me a better mousetrap had never been made. So movies like this, when you feel sentimental about them, you start to thinking, wow, anyone could make it in Hollywood. When Esther arrives in Hollywood, she basically has a one in a million chance of making it, all right? Literally one in a million. But uh, she happens to meet Norman Maine at a party, and he does a screen test with her after a while, they're in the first movie together, and of course they fall in love. So Dorothy Polka and Robert Carson and another writer, I didn't write his name down, are credited with writing the script, but Dorothy would say she couldn't really remember what she contributed to it, which I thought was really honest of her. Um, it was directed by William Wellman. It was up for seven Oscars and only won one, and that was by Mr. Wellman for Best Story. Um, so, um, part of, uh, part of Esther's motivation and her ambition to be somebody is the fact that she's starstruck. She looks at movies whenever she can, and she's grown up in North Dakota, and she knows that there's more to the world that's out there, which is uh, one of the reasons why I find that, sure, there are a lot of Hollywood movie stars that are from New Jersey. Uh, Tom Cruise is one of them. But a lot of them come out of the Midwest, like Greg Kinnear and Brad Pitt. So I always um, like to, uh, well, she comes from North Dakota, but I like to see those references to those outposts Midwestern and Western states that um, produce such great actors and actresses. Now, um, part of the humor behind this movie is that the prices. So when, upon Esther's arrival to Hollywood, she rents a room. It's $6 a week, and it says no cowboys. Now. $6 a week, and right underneath the listing for her room, there is an apartment for something like 
um, I think, $23 a month. So I, I love that part of when you see an old movie and, you know, they say, fill it up, and the gas attendant goes, uh, the guy goes, how much is it? The gas attendant goes, 50 cents, man, okay, for filling up the tank. So the other um, funny part about this movie is that you get to see how uh, studio heads and PR men and the people who so much aren't in front of the camera but who are in back of the camera, how they run it and how they make decisions. And I think it was an early movie for, for, that, type of, for that type of reflection. This is a great... Hollywood movie about Hollywood, even though Sunset Boulevard and The Player are also great movies, this one's a gem, uh, especially the, the love story behind it. So Orson Welles will say that David O. Selznick, who produced this movie, he ruined the game for everyone in Hollywood. He said that the minute that the producer became a creative, put their creative touch on it, the producer became the boss. And uh, Orson said that back in the old days, the director was the one who was the creative force. And the producer basically showed up to make sure that the movie got under budget. So I happen to like Selznick movies, um, Notorious uh, being one of them. I can think of a couple off the top of my head. So um, Frank Nugent, a critic who gave an early review for this movie, said, Hollywood has no need to go to Ruritania when it has lots of stories in its backyard. And this is part one of two of my City of Angels episodes, and I find that very true. I find that when Hollywood tells stories about itself, it's never a dull moment. Um, so this story of the up-and-coming star going up in the world while her husband goes down has some parallels in real life. And some people say that uh, this story is based on um, uh, Barbara Stanwyck and Frank Fay's relationship, Colleen Moore and John McCormick's relationship, and a producer named Tom Foreman. Also, um, in my book, Flesh and, Fa Flesh and Fantasy, uh, it say that Ruby Keeler and Al Josen's Love Story was also possibly based on this movie. Now, there's an interesting Hollywood myth that Lana Turner was an extra on the set. For the last two weeks here at Orca, the crew has been so helpful with me, I kept forgetting my Lana Turner notes. I want to do a story about, talk about Lana as a preclude to the City of Angels because Lana is a sterling, startling example of the pitfalls and traps of Hollywood. But I have a feeling like her ghost just didn't want me to talk about some of the scandals in her life. So uh, I, we, we, taped, we taped one a couple weeks ago, and um, uh, it didn't pick up. And then the last time we taped it, I kept forgetting my notes. You know, I walked all the way home, just forgot my notes. So I like the fact that Lana is supposedly an extra in the 1937 uh, uh, version of Stars Born. She always said, no, she was not an extra. Uh, she was discovered months after the movie came out. So this movie cost something like a mil... It said it cost over a million to make, but there was a profit of uh, $181,000, which I thought was odd because it didn't seem like it was much of a profit. Um, it was filmed October to December in 1936. Can you think of any movie in the last two years that was made in two months, okay? F filmed from October, December 1936, uh, came out uh, the L.A. Uh, premiere at Grumman's was April 20th, 1937, and it did well at the box office. A lot of people like this movie. There's nothing not to like about it, and the fact that Janet Gaynor is consi uh, consistently described as cute, pretty, intelligent, strong, it's kind of nice because she doesn't look like Ava, Lana, or Rita, but she has a certain charm that I think works well in this movie. So check that out and you can catch it on YouTube. Okay, so now we're going to head to 1980s LA. And this movie is not about Hollywood per se. 
but it's definitely an L.A. movie, and it's called To Live and Die in L.A. It has William Dafoe, Walter, William S. Peterson, John Pacal, John Turturro, Robert Downey Sr., um, and a couple other people I can't recall off the top of my head. So this is a William Friedkin movie. He's our director who did um, uh, French Connection. Okay, he was one of the maverick filmmakers that got to Hollywood in the 70s. Uh, one critic uh, described this as his comeback movie. William Friedkin never went anywhere, and a lot of directors go highs and lows, but uh, I don't view this as a comeback movie. I just view it as another one that he knocked out of the park. So uh, basically, it's, it's a story about how the line between the outlaw and the law gets blurred. I love that type of um, I love that type of plot. So William Defoe plays this guy named Rick Masters. So he's an artist, which is an excuse for the really horrific bad soundtrack by Wang Chung. Okay, if you can get through the soundtrack, you can get through anything. Okay, so he's an artist, but he's also a counterfeiter, and he's a really bad dude. Okay, he's a really really bad dude, and he. Um, kills William S. Peterson's partner who was about to retire in three days. Now, I watched this movie years ago with my grandmother. We had a really good time um, just checking it out because movies like this weren't really made. They're not really made. They weren't really made a lot back then, and they might be made now, so it's a template. But back then, this was rather cutting edge. Also, uh, a great quote in the movie The Player. Two writers are pitching a movie, and they say to Griffin Dunn, no stars. And Griffin goes, what? And then the, the guys go, no stars, just talent. OK, so this movie literally didn't have any stars. Um, William S. Peterson, um, I think he's from uh, Nebraska, but he was a Canadian actor. And Freakin gave him a couple pages, and he had the part within just reading a page and a half of it. He, uh, William uh, Peterson, suggested his friend John Panko, who was a Chicago um, theater person. And I also think that Mr. Defoe was too, even though he did stuff in New York City. So I guess this was everyone's big breakout, including John Totoro, who I'm on the fence about because He's not my type of, he's just not my type of actor. I, sometimes I don't even feel like he's acting. But because of his cousin, Ada, who is so brilliant that she literally, I mean, you can't tell when she's acting. You think she's really the person. So I'm kind of thinking that Mr. Totoro, when he goes into a role, he's doing the same thing. But I don't know. Um, Robert Downey Sr., who is Bob Jr.'s dad, um, directed the iconoclastic Putney Swope back in the 70s. You need to check that out. And he occasionally shows up in movies. So it was great to see him as William S. Pearson and John Panko's uh, boss. Now, um, partly, you know, I'm watching with my grandmother and, you know, checking out the end of it. And the beginning, there are parts of the movie that are confusing because Friedkin and the man who wrote the novel, who's a former Secret Service man, um, Gerald Pitovich. Gerald Pitovich, uh, I think, wrote the book, and they collaborated on the script together. So sometimes there's more Friedkin in the script, and sometimes there's Mr. Pitovich. Mr. Pitovich actually got into trouble uh, where he was working with the Secret Service. Someone. Um, they didn't want to give him a promotion. There was jealousy because he was making a movie. I mean, just ridiculous stuff. Uh, OK, Secret Service, Secret Service, but this is Hollywood, OK? So, so the plot can be a little uneven. You've got to, got to follow it. When the, it's the beginning of the movie, and there's the retirement party for William's uh, then partner there, the partner is seen going off on his own to stake out uh, William Defoe's counterfeiting, um, uh, what do you call it, domain there, compound. 
and he gets shot because he goes into the dumpster to find where the money is usually hid and the garbage bag's full of grass and one of William Defoe's minions shoots him. So my grandmother could never figure out, was William S. Pearson's partner dirty or was he just being a cowboy and go, you know, going to try and bust the bad guys? And we came away with the feeling that he was dirty, okay? So the movie's about good and bad, but it's also about blurring the distinction between bad. So as uh, Mr. Pearson's character there, uh, Rick Chance, is going through the motions. The guy is a bungee jumper. He's a base jumper. He lives for thrills. All he wants to do is catch the guy who, that, who shot his buddy, right? So he gets into trouble frequently th through the movie. He flouts authority. There's this crazy car chase. That is one of the best car chases I've ever seen, and I started thinking about French Connection. Actually, Mr. Friedkin had thought of the car chase back in 1963. He was driving home from a wedding or going to a wedding, and he fell asleep, and he found himself in the wrong lane with oncoming traffic, so he backed up. Already was really lucky, almost killed himself. So he got to thinking, how can I use that in a movie? So we see that in the movie. We see that idea of a backup car scene, they had to film in all types of crazy ways. It took six weeks to, six weeks to shoot, and um, I like it. I really I like the scene a lot. There's also a foot chase scene where uh, William S. Pearson is running after John Turturro in the airport. William S. Pearson's doing his own stunts. They got in trouble with airport security because airport security thought that Pearson was going to like break his butt on the floor, OK? So they pretended to just. Uh, they pretend to acquiesce to the airport officials' demands, pretend to run it through as rehearsal, but they actually had the camera going. It's stuff like that that I love about Hollywood. So um, we haven't really talked much about uh, um, William Defoe's character, but that's because He's just a really bad guy. I mean, he's scary, all right? He's one of my top 50 villain, movie villains of all time. The Joker, of course, is number one, right? But uh, I don't know where uh, Rick Master fits in, but he fits in like top 25 or something like that. Um, so the line, the differences between them, or the similarities are, both Peterson and Defoe's characters are killers. But one has a license to do it, and the other one just does it because he's a psychopath. Um, and it came out, it was, the premiere was November 1st, 1985. Um, it had a $3.6 million opening for that weekend, which is not bad, back in the 80s. It ended up grossing $17.3 in North America, and then made an additional $6 million somewhere else. So that was pretty good. It made a profit. Um, I'm not going to blow the ending today, but the studio did not like the ending. Friedkin had to change. He had to film two alt He had to film another ending because the studio heads were hollering. So I was reading one critic saying, um, uh, to live and die in LA, uh, he says something about to live and die in L.A. is okay, but not unless you want a studio head to kill you because he doesn't like the ending of the movie, something like that. So this is a great, um, great action flick. Uh, cops and robbers, y'all aren't going to like the music. Sorry, the music's really blaring, and there's lots of, like, greens and reds, you know, because it's the 80s. Um, you know, it's Reagan time, all right? Everyone had a dollar in their pocket back then. Um, so if you can deal with the music that's going to sound dated, you're going to love this flick. And William S. Pearson looks awesome. I mean, I think he, 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 he sucks to me anyway. But to see him whipcord thin like that, running around, it's really cool. He looked really, really cool. OK, so um, check that one out. The last movie we're going to do today is um, the penultimate to me, Hollywood movie. Some say Sunset Boulevard is, and for certain reasons, Sunset Boulevard is the penultimate Hollywood movie, but this one takes the cake. As with um, our Star is Born movie, they started the movie off uh, a medium shot of a screenplay, and they're describing the opening sequence. The movie The Player uh, starts off as if they're filming the movie, see the clacka, 
and they would go, uh, take one. Or it's like take 11, scene four, something like that. So um, The Player is Robert Altman's best movie in the whole world. Uh, it has everyone, he usually uses an ensemble cast when he does his flicks. So in this particular movie, uh, you see, and did I write everyone's names down? Okay, so you see Vincent D'Alfronio, Sidney Pollack, Dinah Merrill, um, Tim Robbins, uh, Harry Belafonte, Sherry Belafonte, Jack Lemmon. This is a movie about Hollywood people, and it's about Hollywood people making a Hollywood movie. So to talk a little bit about Mr. Robert Altman, he has, he's one of the few directors, the only directors, who's won a Gold Bear in Berlin, the Golden Lion of Venice, the Golden Palm at Cannes. He's won a BAFTA Award, a Lifetime, uh, Lifetime Filmmaker Award, uh, Cannes Film Festival Award, and New York Film Critics Award. He's one of those uh, directors who, of course, had a lot of ups and downs, but um, he had few of them because he was the maverick auteur uh, producer. Okay, Mavic auteur directors. He would uh, let his actors improvise. He frequently fought uh, with studio heads. He didn't get along with them. And he didn't have a lot of respect for writers either because he felt that you should be flexible when you putting, when the actor is putting the writer's words into the mouth. Sometimes it's the way the actor the way the actor is translating it uh, can work to a filmmaker's best advantage. And of course, Mr. Marlon Brando is the best example of that. So um, Robert Altman made MASH, and that was like his first big movie. Uh, he, um, he hated and despised the TV show, and I did too. I couldn't stand watching that show as a kid because it was dull and boring and I hated the canned laughter. There was nothing funny about war to me. Um, yada, yada, yada. Okay, so he found the television show um, racist. So um, that he knocked out of the park. That is also considered one of his finest movies. Nashville, I happened to see at uh, drive-in in Jackson Hole, the year that uh, I turned, I was 11, but I was turning 12. And we must have watched that three or four times at the drive-in. That's a great movie. And again, ensemble cast. Um, Julie Christie, Lauren Beatty, um, Ronnie Blakely, some people playing themselves and some people are playing characters telling a story. Uh, and uh, Nashville is a day in the life of about 20 people. So McCabe and Mrs. Miller is another one of his little gems, and that's Warren Beatty and Julie Christie. And they're both taken on Sears and Roebuck. That's a Western Gothic and a seriously scary movie. Um, not a date movie, but a movie if you want to sit back and watch about how, uh, you know, if you're a fan of Deadwood and you like to see movies about the West, you'll love McCabe and Mrs. Miller. So one of the last... Oh, and then there's Three Women, which is this crazy story that I can't remember. And then one of his last movies that he made was Kansas City, which has Harry Belafonte, um, uh, uh, Delma McRulney, Jennifer Jason Leigh, and a whole bunch of other people. And that's set in Kansas City in the 30s, and it mainly uh, deals with uh, the politics of the Democratic Party. All right, so all these movies that I just said, Nashville, MASH, McCabe and Smiller, Three Women, Kansas City, please check that out. But the one that is my favorite is the one that we're about to talk about. So the, a player is a term for someone who's a hungry studio executive who is probably wanting to be a studio head. And the player in this movie is Griffin Mill. Griffin is a character near and dear to my heart. Um, and everybody knows the story, or a lot of people know the story, but I'm spending a summer in Versher. My mom says she's got a surprise for me. And I get dressed up, we jump in the car, she takes me to hand over the nugget, gives me some money, and tells me to enjoy the show. So. I just sat down and I loved every single second of this movie. I saw Griffin and me and I see, um, you know, Griffin is in a lot of us who uh, love film and TV and uh, want to work up the corrupt corporate ladder. 
so um, let's see. Uh, Angela Hall plays Tim Robbins' secretary, and Dinah Merrill plays Brian James's secretary. Uh, Brian James is head of the studio, and my man Brian James, you can catch in uh, Blade Runner. He plays Leon, the guy who puts a hurting on Harrison Ford. I love Brian James so much. He can do anything. He's like an actor's actor. So part of the reason why I mentioned Angel Hall and Dinah Merrill is because the secretaries in Hollywood seem to outlast the studio heads, which is, uh, I'm not sort of surprised. They know where all the secret files are kept. And Dawn Steele and Sherry Lansing are both examples of women who started, I think, out as secretaries and then became studio heads. So um, it was nice to see how the secretaries had a, they were rolling their eyes during some of these scenes. Um, so Griffin is afraid that he's going to lose his job. And he's nervous and he's ambition, ambitious. Uh, but his secretary um, is observant of Ryan. Griffin's having not only trouble with his job, 50,000 scripts are shown to the studio once a year, but only 30 or 40 get passed, get greenlit, right? So he's worried about his job. There's someone sending him some anonymous uh, postcards, it's the disgruntled writer saying that they're going to kill him because he didn't greenlit, his, greenlit a project of his. So, Griffin's a nervous man, um, and as he is nervous about his job, he has to deal with the likes of Peter Gallagher, uh, who is playing a character named Larry Levy, who is another player like Griffin, who is worming his way in the studio, and um, Bonnie Chiro, who's played by Cynthia Stevenson, who is Griffin's girlfriend, who's She's like a little lazy, pathetic, snotty, but he's having problems with her too. So this sets the stage for number one, him trying to find out who's selling him these postcards. Number two, uh, he wants to hit this movie out of the park. And number three, he wants Larry Levy to go back to Fox. He doesn't want to look at Larry Levy at the bargaining table. Enter um, Richard Grant and Dean Stockwell, who both play writers pitching a script called Habeas Cor Corpus to Griffin. As he's listening to the writers, and these guys are stealing the show, by the way, playing the writers. As he's listening to the writer, he has the bright idea. Maybe I'll stick these guys on Larry Levy, the movie will be a dog, and then I'll save the day and look like a knight in shining armor. He's betting on the fact that as the writers are saying them, they got this crazy idea. No stars. And Griffin is like, are you crazy? And Dean Stockwell goes, no Julia Roberts, no Bruce Willis, all right? So Griffin's like, these guys are crazy. So he decides to pitch it to Joe. He decides to give Larry, Larry the chance to pitch it to Joe, uh, Brian James, the head boss. Because Brian James has built his place in the studio on the motto of no stars, just talent, all right? Now, that never happens in Hollywood. I'm sorry. I mean, it happens in the movies, like A Star is Born and, the, and well, maybe The Player. But it doesn't really happen in real life. Those studio heads want stars, OK? They want real flesh and blood commodities that are going to bring in the bucks, all right? So this, quite, this is a great little gem. You'll see lots of different stars playing themselves at various parties and functions, Cher, Gary Busey. Um, and you'll see Tim Robbins do his thing. He really is a class act. I always, I take, I take Tim for granted. Um, but he's, he's, a, he's a fine actor, and um, I should check out more of his movies. So let me see. Um, uh, yeah, aside from the people you'll see, uh, you will see Bruce Willis, and you will see Julia Roberts. But Buck Hendry, Susan Sarandon, Lily Tomlin, uh, James Coburn, John Cusack, Angela Huston, Jeff Goldblum, Jack Lemmon on piano, Scott Glenn, Peter Falk, um, Karen Black, and I think Robert Carradine. So it's, it's a great gem. And the movies about Hollywood and about Hollywood people are some of the best movies made. That's just about it for me. I'm your hostess, Betty St. Laveau. I'd like to thank our crew here at Walker 
for uh, helping me out with the cameras today. I'd also like to thank Gendron Building for its continual support. And my first film uh, professor, Sharon Ardella Warfield Ochison and Claridge, who taught me to appreciate and articulate my thoughts on the silver screen. Until next time, darlings, stay away from those bad movies. Ciao.